Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your hosts of that startup show, Benjamin Law and Ray Johnston. Startup show. I'm the highly ethical Benjamin Law, and alongside me is the just plain good Ray Johnston. I think you just called me plain, but I'll overlook that as this episode we are talking goody tech. Goody, goody, yum, yum. So, how do you build an ethical startup that solves humanity's problems and is both environmentally and financially sustainable? And is tech really the answer to our world's problems? Should we be re-engineering our stomachs to digest plastic and tweaking our taste buds to love polystyrene or simply stop producing crap? And if we do end up eating plastic, will our own crap come out pre-bagged? That would be disgustingly convenient. <laughs> Investment that improves the world is called impact. I love that it's named after the font that appears in memes. I think every type of startup should have their own font. For on-demand apps, there's Courier for anything to do with drones, there's Ariel and Comic Sans for the criminally insane. <laughs> so no change there. Me Too and the Arab Spring have shown the power of the internet as a way to get the voices of the disempowered heard. So there's fantastic possibilities. But it's the same technology that gives us social media bubbles, fake news and opinions replacing facts. Would anthropogenic climate change be solved now if it wasn't for coal lobbyists talking up wind turbine syndrome on Facebook? I feel a bit ill. Oh, what's up? It's just whenever anyone mentions wind turbine syndrome, I get these waves of nausea. It's called wind turbine syndrome syndrome and it's real no matter what those doctors say. Because what would they know? <laughs> so, can startups fight the good fight? And can you make a profit? Can you be charitable without being a charity? Can you deal with the idea that knowing every dollar you earn is a dollar snatched from the mouths of future children? So now we're being engineered to eat money too? That's weird. On the other hand, if you are a rampaging capitalist, can you greenwash away your guilt with a tax-deductible donation? Like Enviro Lady, Lady Macbeth, out damn carbon emissions! <laughs> well, soon we'll be chatting to some incredible guests without whom the world would be even more of a garbage fire than it is. But first, let's cross to our correspondent on the floor, Stephanie Chung from Girl Geek Academy. Are things looking good down there? Thank you, thank you. Thank you for that throw. Well, like they said, I'm Stephanie from Girl Geek Academy, and today I'm joined with the next generation of problem solvers, Chloe from Korowa Anglican Girls School, and let's see what she's doing on her campaign on how to reduce plastics in the ocean. Chloe? So our group have created a skirt, a fashion item made entirely from 100% recycled plastic bags right from our oceans. These skirts will be ironed out plastic bags that will form a 100% functioning fashionable item which we will be then using plastic bottle caps as buttons. So this can be worn. Oh my God, I need to remake my whole entire wardrobe now. Thank you. Anyways, now back over to you two. Thanks, Stephanie. Tonight we're looking at ideas that will make the world great again. <laughs> Thanks, Donald. But why stop at the world? This is tech. Why not aim to make the universe great again? Yeah, take it back to those days when the entire cosmos was an opaque plasma of protons and electrons with zero unemployment. But hyperinflation. I prefer to think of it as an expansionist phase of rapid growth. <laughs> Our first panellist tonight co-founded online activist superpowers GetUp and Avaz.org. The Monthly said he might be the most influential Australian in the world, which means he has, of course, left the country. Please <laughs> welcome the CEO of Purpose, Jeremy Haymans. <laughs> Welcome, Jeremy. Welcome, Jeremy. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, before I introduce our second panellist, I'm just going to have a drink out of my keep cup. 
which by the way, she invented. Please welcome Abigail Forsyth. <laughs> So before we go any further, we've got one of that startup show's patent conversation starters. Compassionate capitalism. Is it a fantasy or can profit and empathy exist side by side? Well, I think compassionate capitalism might be the only way to save capitalism. Ooh. We, we, you know, the capitalism is clearly in crisis in a bunch of ways. And so people who are trying to genuinely use business to solve the biggest problems in the world are doing something right. Um, we have no choice, I think, but to look at that um, and have this conversation we're going to have tonight. Mm. What about you, Abigail? Yeah, I would, I would second that. I mean, there's obviously people out there in the world trying to do good, and I think you need that baked into what you're doing from the very start for, mm. and, and then see where it goes. Has capitalism become so eroded that some people are arguing that maybe it should be replaced by something else, that it can't actually be saved or salvaged? What's your take? <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the alternatives are not super obvious, right? But I do think there are really exciting models, particularly like thinking about cooperative models where the workers on, in a business actually own that business. Mm. Um, one of the exciting things I think we can now think about how technology could take those models and you could have online cooperatives. Um, there's no reason, for example, why Uber needs to be owned by Travis. You could imagine an Uber co-owned by its drivers. Hmm. 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 Not sure about that one. I, mean, <laughs> I, I, I think that businesses need to be led and, and things need to be led. So you do need someone from whom the, the buck stops and the strategy is decided. So there's, I, I love the idea. Well, you but still have management. It's yeah. just about the distribution of ownership. Yeah. Because yeah. I agree, you still, yeah. you need strategy, you need management. Yeah. We can talk about that all evening and we may <laughs> actually later on, but for now it's time to play a game called Make the World a Better Place. <laughs> We're going to read out a quote and you need to tell us if it was said by a tech business leader or a geeky guru or a spiritual figure who inspired religious zeal. A gaudy guru. But first, let's test our buzzers. Jeremy? A soothing sound. <laughs> what about you, Abigail? <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Here is the first question. Geeky guru or gaudy guru? The quote is, we cannot change what we are not aware of, and once we are aware, we cannot help but change. Who said that? A geeky guru or a gaudy guru? Gotti. Oh, oh. Buzz, please. Gotti. Gotti. The answer is Geek Guru. Really? Ah, it was Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg. Wow. I'm about to lean in. Is it true? <laughs> we are all aware that Facebook is evil, but now that we're aware of it, we cannot not help but not not change. Wow. <laughs> You're okay there? Yes. Yep, yep, yep. I think there is something in that for all of us, Ben. Mm. Now, the next quote is, know the rules well so you can break them effectively. Who said that? Was it a gaudy guru or a geeky guru? Well, I'm just following the logic now, so it must have been a gaudy guru. It <laughs> sounds like something that um, a tech pro would have said. That was said by His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama. Some people may not know that the Dalai Lama is chosen by reincarnation, which coincidentally is the only way that Travis Kalanick will ever return as CEO of Uber. <laughs> Next quote, geek guru or gaudy guru? Humanity's greatest advances are not in its discoveries, but in how those discoveries are applied to reduce inequity. Geek or God? Dive in, be bold. Buzz in, buzz in. Don't have a guess. <laughs> I would say, well, God, again. Okay. That is the ultimate geek, mm. Bill Gates, who I ah. imagine some people worship as a god. <laughs> the founder of Microsoft, whose foundation now improves developing world sanitation. So he went from designing crap operating systems to systems for crap operation. <laughs> Ooh, scandalous. Oh, low blow, Ben, low Sorry. blow. Next quote. Truth is not a reward for good behaviour, nor a prize for passing some tests. Is that a geek guru or a gaudy guru? Hey. Geek. You reckon that's a geek? Yeah. That was 
a oh. gaudy guru <laughs> that was Sri Nisargadha Maharaj, an Indian sage who preached a secret doctrine about the illusion of self which is probably why so few people follow him on Instagram. <laughs> the last thing they want to know is that a selfie is an illusion. Okay, final one, folks. Gotti guru or geeky guru, the greatest action is not conforming with the world's ways. Gotti or geeky? I'm going to try for my third Gotti yeah. in a row. Okay, that was a religious person. <laughs> yes, <method. she> <laughs> A teacher, a Buddhist master. Buddhism may be an ancient tradition, but some of their sayings could be updated. For instance, if a tree falls in the forest and no one posts about it on Facebook, did it ever happen? Whole other question if you involve Snapchat. Absolutely. That is the end of the game and the scores have been recorded and sent to the appropriate authorities for verification and triple checking. We should have them back here by 2021. But now it's time to throw open the pitch ring. Welcome to The Pitch Ring, where we're going to meet three keen entrepreneurs who are trying to improve the world one pitch at a time. Tonight's winner will not only go into our season grand finale with a chance to win huge prizes, but will also take home the coveted prize, which proves they are the Australian version of the unicorn, the Unaroo. Part unicorn, part kangaroo, all fire-breathing monster with 400 hit points. The power of a boxing kangaroo plus the ability to impale while still carrying her baby around with her. Feminist icon and D&D &D character. Tonight we've selected three real startups to pitch their companies to the panel. They'll be judging the ideas on originality, marketability, scalability and how they measure up against our visions of utopia very specific visions of utopia. Mine has blue trees. <laughs> the rules are simple. Rule one, you have two minutes. Rule two, at 30 seconds to go, you're going to hear this sound. Rule three, au pairs will not be allowed in on tourist visas with only a few discretionary exceptions. <laughs> the panel will have an opportunity to give feedback. Time to meet our first pitchers, and yes, there are two of them. That's right, it's the last episode before the grand finale, so anything goes. I'm interrupting your intro, very you sorry. You are, I can't even guess what will happen next. Now, if these folks get their way, you'll be able to volunteer without leaving your desk. Now that's the startup way. Please welcome Matthew Boyd and Tanya Dontas. <laughs> struggle to engage modern day professionals and this negatively affects the work that these charities have and the causes that they represent. One in three Australians volunteer and that's great but that also means that 66% of um, Australians don't volunteer and in fact younger generations are volunteering at half the rate of older generations and the volunteering rate is on the decline. So why aren't younger generations volunteering? We found that it's down to a perceived lack of time, a lack of flexibility in the traditional volunteering sense, and just not knowing where to start. Younger generations want to change the world more than any generation before, but they want to do it in a way that affirms their sense of purpose. So that's why we created Volley. Volley is an online volunteering marketplace that connects the needs of nonprofits with the skills and experiences of modern day professionals. Volley projects are exclusively online, which means you can complete projects from anywhere in the world and around your own busy schedule. And beyond our marketplace, we've created a corporate social responsibility SaaS solution for big businesses that can supercharge their social impact. So if a business wants to connect a staff member with an online volunteering project, with a virtual mentoring opportunity that could be half a world away, or even a virtual hackathon, they can do this through Volley. And what we're doing essentially is giving businesses and their staff the opportunity to change the world on their terms and connect with the causes that they really care about. So we've been going for about two years. Uh, we've seen hundreds of projects go through our platform. 7,000 plus skilled volunteering hours. And we've generated over $360,000 of savings to the current nonprofits using our platform. On average, a project on Volley saves a not-for-profit organisation around $1,000. So we're working with around 400 not-for-profit organisations in Australia and in 13 countries outside of Australia. So that's going really well. The next phase for Volley is to really attack 
corporate social responsibility and change the face of it. It's not a box to tick anymore. It's a way of a business using their staff to change the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew and Tanya. Jeremy, let's start with you. Any questions about Volley? So, great concept. Tell, tell me about how you get that connection online. So, people um, have volunteered for a long time, partly because of the experiences, the relationships that they form uh, in that way. How do you replicate that? How do you avoid this being kind of clinical? Because no one really wants to kind of fill out a spreadsheet in their spare time, right? So, what are the ways that real connections are being made here? Of course. Um, it's a great question. and. For us, we definitely want uh, the nonprofits to be communicating openly with their volunteers. So we tell them to use the technology that's available, whether it's Skype, Google Hangouts, um, phone calls. That connection is still really important. But more than that, we, we have a real emphasis on the impact that each project has. So when a nonprofit posts a project on Volley, the impact is one of the hero parts and that that person will know exactly how their work is going to make an impact on that cause. And that's where the connection really comes in. Thank you so much for that, Tanya. What about you, Abigail? Any questions for Matthew and Tanya about Volley? Hi, it's how do you, I mean, how do you vet the, the, the um, charities that go on and, and the people that are responding to make sure they're gonna be able to deliver the, the work that they're volunteering for? Um, yeah, so, um, We've got some very tight terms and conditions yep. and privacy policy. We, um, we worked with a lot of children's charities. They tend to have um, tight processes and procedures. So the terms and conditions of privacy, privacy policy are airtight with uh, the platform. That's, that's around data security, um, privacy, all that sort of thing. Um, intellectual property of all work produced actually belongs to the charity organisations as well, which, yep. um, which they quite like. But as the applications come through, they sign up with their LinkedIn profile, um, typically, or they input their professional experience. So that charity can see the person's professional experience. But then we say, you've got three or four applicants there for your website development project. Get in touch with them. You know, touch base with them. There's, there's two there that, you know, you're sort of tossing up between yeah. Jessica and James. But they can then find out the passion beyond just the skill set. And Jess might say, your organisation means the world to my family. You were there 10 years ago. Whereas James might just say, I just want to volunteer. Yeah. So that way we're protected, the data's protected. From a legal point of view, we're all good. You can see the professional experience and then there's that human communication to identify if it's the right fit because it's our experience that it's not just the skill set, but the passion that's driving someone with an organisation, which will ensure that they do a really, really good job. And just to add in as well, in the 400 projects that we had, have had so far, the quality of work has been sky high and it's something that's really blown the non-profits away and something that doesn't often happen in the non-profit sector. It's a big issue. So I think it's showing that what we're doing is working. And, and so how do, you, how do you network that out so that you build credibility for what you're doing so it's, it's trusted beyond what you're saying? Well, we have a tiny marketing budget yeah. and we've grown really well and it's been really exciting. We focus on doing what we do well. Yeah. So we launched with 20 not-for-profit organisations and we said just use Volley. And we just ensured that the work was done to a really high standard every time yeah. because volunteering is one of this thing, one of these things where, oh, it's just volunteering, you know, and charities left high and dry time and time again. So with the process of a charity clearly defining what they need, which often they fall short of because yeah. they're just like, well, you know, we just need to get someone in. So clearly articulate the problem. Yeah. And so the person knows what is required, the time when it's due. Um, and as a result, people are completing projects on time, applying for new projects. We've had people quit their jobs and join charity organisations. So oh, that's awesome. we're helping people yeah. to, yeah. you know, find, find what's really important. So just, just clearly defining that process, making it easy, four clicks between jumping on the platform and having applied and obviously the, the convenience of carrying it out from anywhere. Thank you so much. Would you join me in thanking Tanya and Matthew? Now it's time to cross back to Stephanie on the floor. Are you keeping your head above water? Glug, 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 glug. Oh, just barely, Ben, just barely. Thanks. Anyways, I've got two other amazing Ocean Guardians with me today from Korowa Anglican Girls School, and they're gonna tell me a bit about how they're fighting plastics in the ocean. First, let's go to Maddie. Well, my group has been creating an app called Renew, and basically what you do with this app 
is you can put in your statistics almost. So basically the app will ask you questions. For example, how much plastic do you buy per week? How much do you throw out? Things like that. And by doing, by collecting that information, the app will generate tips that it will give you every day on how you can help reduce your plastic waste and therefore help reduce the plastics in the ocean. And also when you open up the app, there will be my project progress section where you click on it and you can see how you're doing, how you're improving, um, new section, what's happening all over the world with plastic, um, global, so what global projects are going on on how to help plastics in the ocean and the DIY space which is where you can search up DIYs from other people on what you can do with your recycled plastics. Oh that sounds amazing so it's like a calorie counter but better. Oh, I need one of these. Anyways, now let's go over to Eloise and let's see what she has to say. So my group's working on an app that try is trying to decontaminate the recycling of plastics. So there are seven different types of plastics and they all basically look the same, but they're all recycled in different ways. So for example, this type of plastic is five, so PP, and it's recycled completely different to this one, which is one. And so we'll divide it into the seven and on the app it'll show you where you can recycle it in Melbourne, um, how it's recycled, because sometimes you can just dump it at your Coles and, local Coles and Woolworths or even put it in your recycling bin. And other different types of plastics you have to go and get recycled from um, a company that specialises in that. So we're going to try and help get plastic out of the ocean and make sure our recycling, because a lot of recycling goes to landfill because it's got all this different stuff that can't be recycled together. So, yeah. Wow, um, I think I gotta go take a chance uh, and look at my plastics, how I'm recycling them. Thanks for inspiring me. This has been amazing. We're gonna swing it back over to you two now. Thanks, Stephanie. You're watching that startup show while Google is watching you. It's the circle of life. Our second pitch is business can teach you anything. I'm choosing Portuguese history, 1423 to 1426. Filling a little gap in my knowledge there. Please welcome Prasad Murthy. Hi, I'm Prasad and I'm one of the co-founders co, co of Allrounder. At Allrounder, we believe uh, we're in the business of empowering people. How many times have you tried to learn something but you've never been able to find somebody nearby who could teach you that? Or more importantly, how many of us even realize that we already have the skills and knowledge that other people want to learn, but we've never found the right audience to do that? And that's why we've created Allrounder. To put simply, Allrounder is a hyper-local skills and knowledge transfer marketplace that connects students who want to learn something with the instructors that can teach them that. And the way we've designed the whole user experience of Allrounder is for it to be as simple as performing a Google search. So all you do is you go to Allrounder, you search for what you want to learn, and you're immediately shown a list of instructors who can um, teach you what you want to learn at various price points. And that's why, despite being in, in its infancy, Allrounder has helped over 300 people connect and learn over various subjects such as maths, physics, chemistry, and more contemporary subjects such as uh, piano, tennis, and yoga lessons. Put simply, there is no limit to what you can learn and teach on Allrounder. And which is why we believe that with some funding, we can help create more awareness of what the Allrounder platform can do for people and help them empower themselves as well as teach other people what they already know. And once we have that funding and we grow our user base to a critical mass, we can then take it to emerging markets where we'd have first to market advantage. What we plan to do is connect with other industries that can leverage the uh, benefits of a connected platform such as Allrounder in terms of the ecosystem that we've built connecting students and instructors. So to put it quite simply, I'm quite excited to see where the possibilities take us and how many people we can help empower through a platform like Allrounder. And with that, I thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Prasad. Ethica, do you have any questions? Yeah. Um, what, what is critical mass? Like how, how, when will you have enough people to sort of give this the weight it will need to when be? When someone searches for something and they see a list too long to scroll, that's yeah. critical mass. Yeah. <laughs> and you'll need to get up the Google rankings for when I type in singing lessons or 
Yes, pretty yeah. much. So, so, so do you have any idea of what that volume is? As long as there's enough um, organic traffic that drives people to our site, it, it does not matter um, in terms of quantity, it's more about the quality. Uh -huh. And that's what Google rewards. Okay. What about you, Jeremy? Any questions? So what do you think is going to be harder, the supply or the demand, right? So uh, how do you motivate these teachers? Because there's a lot of evidence that people actually get a lot of intrinsic satisfaction out of teaching. Sure. And maybe even putting the financial transaction in the middle of that yep. is actually going to depress some of your supply. Have you thought about other models where you can still make revenue, but where people who actually want to do this um, for intrinsic satisfaction can do it without it feeling like a transaction? Sure, so at the moment, the platform is built so that people don't have to feel pressured that they have to subscribe to a particular model, business model. Come on the platform, there's no barrier to conversion. As long as people see that you are there, you can, uh, you can reach them. And once we reach, like what we said, critical mass, then the people who are truly entrepreneurial can then choose to pay for paid listing, for example, and then be seen um, or gain more uh, exposure than those who want to do it for an intrinsic purpose. Thank you so much, Prasad. Could you, you please join us in thanking Prasad and all round us? And now it's time to pick these awesome brains to find out how we can save <laughs> the world. Bit of a tall order, I think we've got it here. Abigail, owning a cup is not exactly a new idea, <laughs> I'm gonna say. How did you turn it into a world-changing movement? Uh, I'd say integrity in, in the mission of what, of what I was trying to do. So 10 years ago, everyone was drinking out of disposable cups. Mm. Maybe it was sort of a status symbol in many ways of a busy uh, life. And through working in a cafe business, I realised they weren't, dis weren't recyclable and thought it's, it's just so wasteful. Like mm. it's, it's such a symbol of a wasteful life. And so it's, it's that. It is just a plastic cup, but it's that other bit. It's the brand, it's, it's the mission that, that, that has resulted in the success, I would say. And when we talk about the success that's resulted, what success are we looking at? How many keep cups have been sold? A lot, <laughs> a lot. So we're, we've got offices in um, the UK now, LA and Melbourne, and um, yeah, they're sold all over the world. Mm. Now, Jeremy, how do you use technology to connect people for good and whose version of good are we talking about because that's a value system right well that's part of the challenge we have right now you know we have these huge technology platforms have gotten very powerful and their version of good is kind of defined by uh by whoever the, the entrepreneur is and i think that's actually challenging so ultimately we need to ground technology and these platforms in a set of values i think technology and technologists need to actually develop a deeper worldview Mm -hmm. You know, often these Silicon Valley guys are so insular, right? And so their worldview is like, innovation can change the world. The reality is innovation is not enough to change mm -hmm. the world. You have to look at what's happening in, at the level of power. Who's got power, who doesn't? So when you talk about developing a worldview, does that imply that that's something that's developed parallel alongside the product that they're developing? Or is this something that should be baked in right at the start? Well, I mean, ideally it's baked in. I think the challenge is that some of the people who start these businesses don't have a perspective mm. um, on social justice. They don't understand power and marginalisation. Because a lot of the people who start these businesses and get the VC funding look a whole lot like the VCs. They have a lot of privilege, right? So I think mm -hmm. that's an interesting challenge. In terms of how these businesses should be built, you absolutely want to build the social mission in from the start. I think the important thing is not whether, you know, um, there's a nice CSR program mm. wrapped around a business. What really matters is the business itself. Sure. Does the core you know, economic engine of the business harm the world or benefit the world? Mm. And that's what we should be focused on. But to what extent can you anticipate that from the outset? Look at a company like Facebook. I imagine their business model, yes, to sell advertising, but two, to connect mm. people. But as a result, they've connected a lot of white nationalists and they have sold data and they have disseminated conspiracy theories. Could they have anticipated that from the start? Well, I think that the uh, <laughs> yes is the short answer. Yeah. And I think also, like, Facebook operates within a system. They raised um, billions of dollars of capital. They're now a public company. Um, they are accountable to those shareholders. So we also have to understand that Facebook um, operates within a system that pressures it to extract, extract, extract mm. from us, the people who are participating, right? 
we're like the animals on a farm and Facebook is a participation farm and they're extracting all of our energy and ultimately that energy goes um, to the people who own Facebook. Mm. So making the world a better place, it's become a bit cliched now. It's, it's almost meaningless. How do we inject meaning back into a phrase that expresses something genuine again? It's a difficult question. So government's broken, religion's broken, capitalism's broken. Oh, that's oh, cheery. But, <laughs> and, and the UN Sustainable Development Goals mention human rights once. Mm. So I think there is a broader conversation to have about ethics and human rights and, and, and what those things mean and bake them into the structures that we're... And what's the company's role in all of this? Companies are some of the most powerful economic mm. entities mm. in the world calling the shots. So do they have to take the lead on being agents of social change? And can they actually be trusted given that a lot of the problems in the world now are because of various companies in the first place? Yes, I'm not sure. I mean, I would say one of the things that... I mean, just in my little world, so we started off with a, with a purpose of what we were trying to do. We've worked back through our supply chain to make mm. sure that our supply chain is sound and that's been happening all over the world with a lot of companies, fix your supply chain. And now we need to look forward. Like, what are you making and how is it being disposed of at end of mm. life? Like, it's pretty rude for Coca-Cola, McDonald's to be making products that are just rubbish mm. and then ask us as consumers to feel bad about how we dispose of that product mm. at end of life. So there needs to be, that is a whole piece of change that I think could be quite transformative, that mm. if, we're, if, if companies are responsible for the waste they create, like Facebook said they'll be solar powered by 2020. What's, what's, why have you taken so long? Mm. You, you make billions and billions of dollars. <laughs> mm. You know, the coffee companies that make, they've made billions of dollars of profit in disposable cups. Why haven't they invested in the technology to make them better? Because mm. they, haven't, they haven't been held to account. I agree. And to your point about, you know, Coca-Cola or McDonald's, I mean, certainly a, a company like Coca-Cola, it should just get out of its core business, right? Mm. I mean, I don't, it doesn't matter how great their environmental policies are or even if they fix their supply chain. If mm. the core business is making people sick, mm. that's the core impact that Coca-Cola has on the world. And so a company like that should be trying um, to actually figure out how to change the fundamental yes. economic engine of the business. But do they have any incentive to, considering that their primary purpose for existence is to make money? Is it actually Coca-Cola's responsibility or is it someone else's, like government's? Well, I mean, certainly there's a role for government. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, what they call in America the soda tax. Mm -hmm. I think if you're going to tax anything, tax, tax soda. Um, but, but no, it is also the responsibility of these businesses. They are able to shift their models. That's what businesses have done from time immemorial. You know, you see, a, you see one um, business decline, you create the next horizon of growth. And so um, that's what some fossil fuel companies are recognising by investing heavily in renewables. And, you know, there's plenty of other things that a company like Coca-Cola could be selling that people actually need and that doesn't make people sick. Mm. Now, in these traditional industries, uh, we do see the unpleasant side effects of business. We see you know, pollution, sweatshops, all these sorts of things. But in tech businesses, there are possible unintended consequences that we don't necessarily see. How can they be addressed? Well, one thing I think we should all demand as the people who use these platforms that the algorithms that shape our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, our political opinions are transparent to us. Mm. So we should know what that, you know, Colonel Sanders secret recipe is. We should be able to turn dials on, on our Facebook and Instagram and everything else and actually determine who do I want to hear from? What opinions do I want to be exposed to? That's the kind of thing that both we as users need to demand of these platforms and it's something the government can demand of these platforms. Mm. Abigail, when you're starting a new business, it's hard enough to do that. There are so mm. many moving parts. There's so much stuff to do to get it up. So are we expecting a little bit too much to think that startups or new businesses can actually bake an ethos, a socially progressive ethos, into their business right from the no, start? No, if you're not doing that, get out of the way. Mm. You know, you've got to be solving the problem because the problems even get, will change. So keep cup is a solution to the problem, but we're about to become part of the problem because there are now so many reusable cups mm. and people have so many of them. So is that the solution or the problem? Oh. 
So that the onus is on us now to, ch to pivot again and go, well, how do we keep staying in front of, of solving the problem? What are those conversations that you're having at the moment? Well, they're about product stewardship. They're about what happens. Do, do, do we um, have a stream to bring the product back? Do we, mm. you know, how do we? Big oh. questions. So it never stops. So if you, if, if you don't like those questions at the start of your startup, <laughs> stop now because they keep coming. But it's also about those questions making you feel as a, com as a company uncomfortable, but you should actually lean into the discomfort. Absolutely. You've got to surround yourself with people who hold you to account on your values as well. That's really important. Mm. Your impact on the environment, your impact on everything around you, you know, how do you keep up with that as the business grows? It's, it's really hard because the impact of Keep Cup is, is by the people you, is by people using the product. So that's yeah. not even owned by, by the business. But also using the product in the way you intended, not to buy six, but to <laughs> buy the one <laughs> that you keep and don't forget and leave at your workplace and then buy three more. Yeah, well, you can have a few. That's, that's still, that still works. <laughs> <laughs> now, to really move the needle on social change, some say that you need to change the very fabric of a company and how it impacts the world yep. in which it operates, which brings us to benefit corps or B corps. A lot of people might not be familiar with this vernacular. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, what are B corps and how do they work? So Purpose, the company that I started, is a B corp. Um, we're even what's called a public benefit corporation mm. in America, which is like a legal version of a B corp. And basically, B corps sign businesses up to a set of standards around um, environmental impact, around the way they treat workers, conditions, um, all the things that make a business socially responsible. And it's hard. You've got to meet those standards. Um, you've actually got to make the effort and engage with the process, which is significant. And when you've done that, you get a certification. And that certification is basically says that you're a company um, that is socially responsible, that is engaged with these issues. Mm -hmm. There's still a big range of companies within that ecosystem, um, but it is, it's a forcing mechanism for companies to think differently about their impact in the world. It was a great process when we, when we went through it. We have to go through it periodically every few years to kind of renew the, uh, the contract, in a sense, with, with the B Corp. But it's a really interesting model and um, it's something that's spread all over the world. And have we seen any tech companies become B Corps? I mean, I'm sure there are some, but it's significant that none of the famous tech companies that we would uh, you know, refer to as household names have done it. It's interesting. Some um, consumer packaged goods companies have done it. You know, Ben & Jerry's, unsurprisingly, is a B Corp. But at the moment, um, Danone, which is a huge mm. um, manufacturer, is in the process of actually becoming a B Corp. Mm. So, you know, there are big companies thinking of doing this. I think it is telling that the tech companies that, um, that are so important in our lives haven't done this. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy and Abigail. A lot to think about there. We'll be back soon with our third pitch and our panel will decide on the winner. But first, here's the startup mother goose himself, Alan Jones, not that one, with another timeless bedtime story. Oh, hi, I didn't see you there. Don't you love the way narrative drives a great game like Overwatch? I've got a great story for you today. It's called the nerdy duckling. Once upon a time, there was a duckling who was the last of a brood to hatch from his mother's nest. He was ungainly and awkward, unlike all his brothers and sisters who enjoyed the outdoor life and took to water like, well, like ducks to water. The duckling found he was bad at water sports, in fact, at all sports. In cricket, he scored ducks, not in a good way. At golf, he couldn't get close to a birdie. All the other ducklings teased him and called him nerdy. He grew despondent, and one night, while all the other ducks were sleeping off a big game of duck-duck-goose, he ran away from home. The nerdy duckling waddled far from his pond until it came to the city. But as he passed the pane of glass, he caught a glimpse of his reflection, a bunch of nerdy humans. They were wearing helmets and armed with video game controllers. On a large screen, ducks were exploding, and the crowd cheered. The nerdy duckling charged into the eSports arcade, are you hunting ducks as entertainment, he asked. The players admitted sheepishly that they were. Give me a go, he asked. And that nerdy duckling set a new high score, became the hero of the VR Duck Hunt 3D Championship. After no time at all, he went on to become a new darling of the eSports set. 
and long after his fellow ducklings had had to retire from physical activity due to a buggered ACL, the nerdy duckling was continuing to smash it. And the moral of the story is that being an esports champion is a perfectly legitimate career choice, Mum, even for birds. The end. Now, it's time for bed, so take your device and pop under the covers, and I'll think you've gone to sleep. Good night. Our final picture is backing micropreneurship which means I have to add another word to my preneurship dictionary. Please welcome Usman Iftikhar. Hi, I'm Usman. I'm from Catalyzer. I'm the CEO and co-founder. We are a startup accelerator helping refugees and migrants here in Australia to start their own startups. Um, why do we do that? Well, I came to Australia five years ago um, from Pakistan. I had an engineering degree from Pakistan, but couldn't get into employment here. I also did a master's here, but found it really difficult to get a meaningful job. So doing a lot of these casual jobs, you know, like uh, driving Ubers and doing like working at 7-Eleven and things like that. So I got super frustrated and wanted to start my own business because that was the only way that I could see sort of giving my life meaning. Um, and through that process, um, went through another incubator um, and met my co-founder Jake, where uh, we were sort of spitballing ideas and thinking about what can we do. Um, and there was a very uh, clever mentor who told us to actually solve a real problem rather than developing an app that no one's going to use. Um, so we sort of you know, got back and thought about what is the problem that I face that I, we can solve. And that was this big issue of unemployment and underemployment in migrant and refugee community in Australia. So every year there are about um, 200,000 migrants refugees who come to Australia and over 60% of them are either unemployed or underemployed in the first five years. Um, that's a massive issue. Um, and so we are solving that through entrepreneurship. We've run three cohorts through of our accelerator so far. We have 66 people and started 15 new enterprises, both small business to startups. Um, and now what we want to do is scale. Um, um, through our work, we've also been able to go and work with different organizations globally. So in, in Germany, in Italy, in UK, Turkey, and helping them also think about these problems differently and thinking about refugees and migrants as an asset rather than a liability. Um, and so for that work, we've won various awards and I was also named the, uh, I was also named the 2018 Commonwealth Young Person of the Year. Um, and so here tonight, my only ask is that I'm looking for support. So mentors, advisors, VCs who really want to invest in um, sort of moving in that power imbalance in Australia and really supporting migrants, refugees, um, come join us and help us. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Usman. Jeremy, let's start with you. Any questions for Usman and Catalyzer? Well, firstly, you know, it's, it's, it's clear that immigrants and refugees make, often make amazing entrepreneurs. Um, for a whole bunch of pretty obvious reasons. But tell me, what's the business model here? Um, how does this uh, become something that is a business for you? Absolutely, so we take equity in the startups that we help start, mm -hmm. so that's a long-term play, and then the short-term we partner with corporates and foundations who help us sort of run those programs. Um, and then we also are developing a podcast net now, so it's called Migrapreneur Stories, and thinking behind that is we want to do a media play as well um, and try to change the conversation, but that can also have a revenue stream. And there are other sort of smaller consulting projects with governments and with sort of other uh, corporates as well that we can do to be able to make. Abigail, any questions for Usman and Catalyzer? Talk, talk me through that name, Catalyzer. Catalyzer? Yeah. Um, so we looked at Catalyst, it wasn't available online. So we <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but no, the honest answer is, it's, uh, catalyze is a verb. I mean, this is not the right spelling. The right spelling has an E in it. Yes. Uh, but the thinking behind that is that we want to be catalyzing. We want to be thinking about the whole system rather than just, you know, going and trying to change our own thing. Yeah. Um, and so what we're trying to do is play at various different levels from like the entrepreneurs themselves and the grassroots, also at the policy level, at the media and sort of fashion level. There's a whole bunch of different things we're trying to change. That's what the name. Yeah, because oh, I just would have thought having something that um, indicated that, that your business involves migrants and refugees would be inspiring as well. Like it's, you, the connection's not that clear in the, how, mm. do you, how do you bake that into a short summary of what, what your Absolutely. business does? Absolutely. So, well, we say we support migrapreneurs and the migrapreneurs is a term that we've created and that was the thinking that um, there's, you know, there's migrant refugees who yeah. start fantastic startups and social enterprises in Australia, so they're the ones who deserve a special coin name. I mean, all of us who pitch here come from a migrant background, yeah. um, and so that's just one of the testaments of, you know, why we need something like that, and that's the brand that we use more than the catalyzer itself. Yeah, good. And do you um, get, do you have sort of a forum where people who are entrepreneurs who have come from migrant backgrounds can sort of 
mentor and be part of a, of, of a community like that? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So that's what that's what we're doing with our pre-accelerator. So there are mentors who come in at different stages and help out. And a lot of them actually do come from migrant backgrounds because they understand their journey, they've seen yes. that. And they're also coming for our sort of podcast as well because we want to capture their stories of their struggles from the start all the way up to uh, where they're now. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. What is it you can't beat if you can't see it? Yeah, absolutely. Would you please thank Osman, everyone? <laughs>